This is the first time I'm posting anything online about this. I'm a 31-year-old woman, married, and I recently moved back in with my parents due to moving back to the town I grew up. My husband and I are taking our time looking for our own place due to wanting something nice in the area that's usually hard to find. This story takes place in my parents' house, starting back 10 years ago. A description of the house for a bit of context. It's a two-story brick and stone house in city limits, but still surrounded by nothing but woods. You have to go through a garage that leads into the kitchen with the first bedroom to your left. Past the kitchen is the main living room, and to the right is the hall that's very open. In this area, you'll find the main dining room and the second living area, but if you continue straight, you will see the staircase to your left. And even further straight on is my parents' bedroom and bathroom. Going up the stairs, you'll come to the third living area with two sets of French doors side by side that lead to the outside balcony. Going straight, then a sharp left leads you to the other three bedrooms and two bathrooms. This is where the story takes place. The first time I stepped foot into this house, I immediately felt off, like something just wasn't right. I felt a presence, but I didn't know what or who it was. I brushed it off, thinking I was just reading too much into it. I continued to feel this for the next couple of years, and because of this, I didn't much enjoy visiting them. My parents liked to gamble a lot back then, so they would ask me to babysit my baby brother and sister one day on the weekend. My boyfriend, now husband, loved them, so he would always babysit with me. The first few times, I really didn't pay attention to the feeling I would get, because we would be busy playing or eating with the kids. After that, things kind of chilled out, and we would end up watching movies until it was time for us to go to bed. Now, my husband is a freak of nature. It's like he falls asleep the second his eyes are closed. Me, on the other hand, it takes me forever to get comfortable enough to wind down my mind. I also don't sleep well, even when I finally do get to sleep. This night was the first time I saw and heard something in this brand new house. In this room, the bed is facing the doorway, but not directly in front of it. With the double doors open, you can see the front of the staircase and all the way down the hallway, as long as the light is on, that is. This night, only one of the hallway lights was on. I was lying in bed with the TV on, but the volume down low, so I could hear if one of the kids called me. I was almost asleep when I heard one of my siblings coming down the stairs. I opened my eyes a bit and waited for them to get to the bottom, but they never did. I didn't think anything of it. I closed my eyes and began to drift off again. A few minutes later, I heard it again. So I opened my eyes and waited, but again, they never got to the bottom. This time I sat up and listened, a bit spooked, but nothing I couldn't handle. I got a bit nervous, but still I went to check to see if they were there, and maybe they were scared to go all the way down or something. No one was there. Confused and thinking I must have been dreaming, I went back to bed, this time closing one of the double doors. It was a few hours later, around 2.30 a.m., when I felt like someone was very near me, as if they were standing next to the bed right in front of me. Usually, when I opened my eyes, I would see the green glow of the alarm clock on the bedside table, but this time I saw nothing. It was pitch black. I couldn't even see the hallway light on, and the TV had turned off on its own. I felt like I couldn't move. I was awake now and scared to my bones. I was finally able to call out my husband's name loud enough to wake him. He reached over and turned on the light, and right then the scared feeling went away and I was able to move. I freaked out and started crying. I couldn't begin to explain to him what happened, because even if I had, he didn't believe in those things. So I told him I was having a nightmare and asked him to go check on the kids. When he came back, he said the kids were fine and got back in bed. With the light on, I was able to fall back to sleep, but it took me forever. The next day, I told my mom about what had happened, and that's when she told me. She had been hearing footsteps on the stairs at night and even saw someone standing by the door at times. She didn't tell anyone because she didn't want to scare the kids. This is when she told me what she had done. She wanted to know what was going on in her house, so she went and bought a voice recorder. One day, she decided to use it and went upstairs while everyone was gone. She asked her typical questions of who is here, what do you want, and why are you here? And then said, you have passed away and need to go into the light. You are not welcome here. The next day, she decided to leave the recorder in one of the bedrooms upstairs. It was recording for about four hours while she was out running errands. I asked if she had checked it, and to my surprise, she said she was too afraid to listen to it alone. I wanted to listen to it. 
Off we went to the computer and began listening to it after it was uploaded. During the four hours she was gone, you could hear something clicking or tapping. Sounds of a drawer opening and closing, but we weren't sure. Then we listened to the part where she was asking questions. Now you could hear a sound that resembled a fan or maybe static throughout the whole thing, so some sounds were indistinguishable. But the one sound we did hear chilled us to the core. When she asked, what do you want, it gave us an answer. I'm changing my brother's name for this, but the answer was Jamie. It didn't answer any other questions except for that one. I cried immediately. Jamie wasn't having night terrors for no reason. Something was there for him every night. We soon asked a friend to cleanse the house. For a long time, everything's been okay. My brother stopped having night terrors. My mom was able to sleep comfortably and all was good again. Until now. I've been living in this house for a month and a half. For the last three weeks, I've been seeing things everywhere, especially when I'm alone. Because of this, I won't stay alone anymore. I get this strong feeling of being watched. I had the feeling of someone pulling on my blanket at night. I think it's time for another cleanse. And just for your information, I'm the third generation on my mother's side of the family that is able to see spirits. My dad's side of the family has, in the past before I was born, practiced black magic. I don't like speaking to them, and I won't dabble in any of the spiritual stuff most people do. I stay as far away from it as possible, and I recommend that you do too. Even if you're careful, these spirits can haunt for a long time, even after you are gone. This happened in 2011, when I was a seven-year-old girl. I just talked to my mother about this incident and decided to share it. I lived with my grandmother, father, mother, and two dogs, quite far from town. The house was big, so I usually played hide-and-seek with my mom a lot. I don't remember which month it was, so my mom filled me in on this. She said it was October, during the holidays. This one particular day, my dad was out driving my grandma to the hospital, as she had an appointment with the doctor so I was left alone with my mom. After several rounds of hide-and-seek and watching a movie with my mom, it began to get dark outside, and my dad still wasn't home. I've always been scared of potential home invasions, so I was paranoid all day because my dad wasn't with us. He made me feel very safe. Me and my mom decided to play Monopoly. Fast forward an hour. When I was seven, I thought I was very sly, so I kept stealing money from my mom's stash, now that I look back, she was probably pretending not to see. As I was taking a $50 bill from her Monopoly cash, she said, The power will go out soon. This left me completely puzzled, as I had no idea how she'd know this. But sure enough, it went out about 15 minutes later, and I started to panic, because as most little kids, I'm scared of the dark. I later found out that there was a power outage in my area because of a storm, and my mom was notified of it. She handed me this Nokia phone and let me play my favorite game on it, which at the time was Doom. She told me to go hide under the bed sheets if I was scared, and that she would be back soon. I asked where she was going, but she didn't answer. As she headed out of the room, she locked the door. I lay under the sheets, killing some monsters on the game for what felt like hours, but was probably only five minutes. Footsteps were heard in the kitchen, which was next to the room I was in, so I took the sheets off my head and yelled out, Mom? Glad that she was back because I was really scared, but no answer was heard. The footsteps didn't stop, so I yelled again, Mom, can you please come? I'm scared. After I had said that, the footsteps stopped completely. I got a sudden rush of adrenaline, so I held tight onto the phone and dashed out the room to the kitchen, which was empty. I was left puzzled but didn't wait for long as I ran to the door, unlocked it as there's keys on the inside too, and ran to the corridor. So the corridor has four doors on the right side, one at the very back, which I never was allowed to go in. I later learned that the room was where my great-grandma died, and no one had touched it ever since. It also had stairs next to it, leading to the second floor, and one at the front, which led to the outside. The fourth door I came through was the closest to the outside door, so I quickly opened the outside door, ready to run out. But the rush of adrenaline was gone, and I got scared of the outside, too. It was very dark, and I was barely able to see. My only choices were go back to the room I came from or scream for my mother. I chose number two and started screaming for mom over and over again. 
I guess I wasn't loud enough because there were no replies. I remember starting to sweat and panic, different scenarios playing through my head. Scenarios like a murderer killing my mom and coming for me next, or my mom leaving me forever. I know it's stupid, but I was only seven after all. I remember looking down at my feet and beginning to cry. More footsteps were heard, but this time behind me. I looked behind me and saw a silhouette of a tall person. I'm assuming it's a male, due to the body build, at the end of the hallway, standing in front of the door. I can't recall what he looked like because it was all black. I stared at him for about 15 seconds in pure horror. This got my adrenaline pumping again and I ran out the door, towards the outside toilet, only to be greeted by my mother who looked worried as hell. After I told her what happened through uncontrollable sobs, my dad was in the driveway already parking his car. My granny was left at the hospital for some treatment. He searched the house but no one was found, so my mom told me it was just my imagination. But I know what I saw and heard. Fast forward seven more years, I live in another house and I randomly remembered about this incident and talked to my mom about it. She seemed quite hesitant about telling me this, but in the end I convinced her to tell me. What she said gave me chills. Apparently when I was four, I started to stare at one particular corner in the kitchen and laugh like crazy. My mom asked me what was so funny and every time I pointed to the same corner but never told her why it was funny. After a few months, the random giggles I let out when staring at the corner didn't stop. What made my mom lose it was the fact that I started speaking random German words that I'd never heard before. We have no relatives that are German or can speak German, and I wasn't introduced to technology at that age either. My mother knew it was German because she can actually speak a little, but she never spoke it. She bribed me with candy to tell her how I learned to say the following words in German. It. Help. Chocolate shower, and war. My response completely shocked her. I pointed to the same corner again and said, he taught me how. My mom kept her cool though. She asked me who I was talking about and I said, the man who makes me laugh. My mom asked me what he looked like, but I only said he looks like a shadow and that he's from Germany. When she asked where the man lived, I pointed to the second floor. This all made sense because I always hated the second floor and never went up there because I felt like I was being watched. My parents took it upon themselves to Google the history of the house, and sure enough, it was built by Germans. I don't remember any of this, but my mom kept on reassuring me it happened. My father said he remembers it too, but decided not to tell me until now. I talked to the German man in the corner up until five years of age. I'm pretty sure you can put two and two together. But if not, the man I saw when I was seven was the same man I talked to when I was four. Every time I go back to visit my grandma, I always feel uneasy. When I was eight years old, my family moved into the house I grew up in. It wasn't an old house, and no one had died in it. It didn't even feel creepy just an average suburban house in your average southern suburbs. The way the house was set up, when you came in the front door, there was a hallway with two bedrooms and a bathroom to the right, the large living room in front of you with a half wall separating it from the dining room to the left, and the kitchen on the other side of the dining room. Where the kitchen and the living room met, there was another small hallway and the master bedroom, a bedroom that was used as an office and a bathroom, and then a breakfast nook leading to a laundry and utility area at the end of the kitchen. My room was to the right of the front door and down the hallway past the bathroom with the other bedroom on this hallway used for storage mostly, as I was my mother's only child, and my half-brother and sister didn't live with us and rarely came to visit. The first time anything really happened in the house, I was about nine, and I'd lost my last tooth. Still being a kid, of course the tooth fairy was expected, so when I woke up in the middle of the night and saw a figure standing in the middle of my room, I assumed it was the tooth fairy. It was bald and only about three or four feet tall, about the size of an average child, standing completely still in the middle of my room. I remember my parents telling me that if I was awake, the tooth fairy wouldn't leave me any money, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. When I got up the next morning, I excitedly told my parents that I'd seen the tooth fairy the night before. I described what I'd seen, but they told me it was just a dream. For the next several years after that, I continued seeing and hearing minor things in the house. When I was home alone, cabinet doors would open and close, 
or I'd hear dishes being moved around in the kitchen or catch movement out of the corner of my eye. The most common was often at night I'd wake up to see a young woman hovering over my bed. She was dressed like the Rosie the Riveter character from the old posters from the 1940s, with a red and white bandana around her hair and a denim shirt. When I would see her, she'd stare at me for a few minutes and then slowly float over my body and out through the wall behind me. I was never afraid of her, though. When I was about 12, my parents divorced, and it was just me and my mother living in the house. By the time I was in my late teens, my mother was rarely at home, and my house became the hangout for me and my friends, most nights everyone gathering together to play Dungeons and Dragons or something similar after work. One night we were hanging out but didn't want to play, so I pulled out a Ouija board I'd picked up at the local toy store a few weeks before wanting to try it out. We sat in my room to play with the lights out and the door closed, and it went pretty normally, nothing crazy happening for the most part. The only strange thing that happened was at one point we asked something like, show yourself, and at that point we heard the front door open and close, and heavy footsteps come down the hall toward my room. The handle of my door started to turn, and one of the guys jumped up and locked the door before it could open. We didn't hear anything else, no footsteps moving away from the door or anything, and after a while we turned on the light and opened the door to see if my mother had come home unexpectedly. The house was empty, and the front door was locked. We decided we'd had enough of the game at that point, put it up, and everyone went home. A few weeks later, we were hanging out at my house again, this time playing Dungeons & Dragons, though one of the girls that usually came had to work late and had classes in the morning, so she'd said she wouldn't be coming. While we were sitting in the living room to play at around 2 in the morning, suddenly we heard footsteps run across my wooden front porch. It sounded like someone very short or a small child running quickly. Everyone in the room heard it, and we had a conversation wondering if our friend had changed her mind and had just arrived as she was very short, and it made more sense than a child running through the neighborhood at that time of night. When she never came into the house, we all got up to look, and there was no one outside, and her car wasn't in the yard. Her boyfriend, who was with us, gave her a call and verified that it wasn't her, as she just arrived home on the other side of town and was headed to bed. Around this time, the activity in the house picked up. I saw shadow figures with red eyes often in the living and dining room of the house, footsteps and other noises at all hours of the day or night. I started waking up in my room to see hooded figures standing near my window and door. It was around this time my half-brother, who I was close to, passed away. It was sudden, and I hadn't seen him in years as he'd gotten into drugs, and my mother had decided to keep me away from him because she didn't want him to be a bad influence on me. After that, I'd wake up hearing his voice saying my name in the middle of the night, often. On a whim one night, I sat down and typed out a letter to him on my computer that was in my bedroom, since I was home alone that night and I was bored. Now, this computer was hooked up to an old dot matrix printer, one of the really loud kind that makes all kind of racket when it's running. After I wrote the letter, I felt silly for writing it and deleted it without saving it or printing it and shut down the computer before I went to bed. Around three in the morning, I woke up and my bed was soaking wet. At first, I thought my puppy had peed on the bed because he was too small to get down, even though he was housebroken and I'd taken him out just before bed. I got up to let him outside and change my bed sheets when I realized the wet was just water and it was more than a tiny puppy could have made. On my way to take my blankets to the laundry room, I passed the bathroom in my hallway and noticed the light was on, even though I'd turned off all the lights before bed. There, sitting on the counter was a pitcher from the kitchen, with the inside still wet. When I was really young, my brother used to wake my sister and I up by throwing water on us because it made me laugh. When I got back into my room and started making my bed, I noticed a piece of paper lying on top of my printer. It was the letter that I'd written to him and never saved or printed. The computer was still shut down and the printer was off, but it had been printed out torn off the printer, and laid on top of it as if someone had read it. The normal things like this continued for a few years when I lived there off and on, before turning dark shortly before I moved out of the house for good. The hooded figures appeared more often. I woke up one night with a feeling that I was being stared at, only to roll over and see what looked like a rotting corpse a few inches from my face. And one night I woke up to a hooded man standing at the foot of my bed with my bedroom door open when it had been closed before. He held up his hand and a ball of blue light appeared in his palm, which he threw at my face. 
He and the ball disappeared just before it hit me, but the room was so cold that I could see my breath on a normally hot southern summer night. When I was in my early 20s, after I moved out for good, I had one last experience in the house. My mother hadn't been to the house in months and was preparing to sell it. I told one of my cousins about the things that had happened there through the years, and he decided that one night, out of boredom, he and a friend of his would pick me up to go ghost hunting in the house while it was empty. We each had a camera, and he had a voice recorder that he'd brought. We set the recorder in my old bedroom and spent an hour or two wandering around the house taking pictures. When we got done, we came back to my room and sat to listen to the recording and discuss all of the nothing that we'd found. On the recording, we could hear our voices moving from room to room and talking about how my cousin's friend's camera had a sexy shutter sound and the fact that my camera stopped working almost as soon as we walked in the door. About 20 minutes into the recording, when we could hear all three of our voices echoing from the other side of the house, a deep voice that sounded like it was right up against the microphone on the recording spoke, get the fuck out. We immediately obliged. I found out a few years later that my mom actually had several experiences in that house, with waking up to find an older man in his 50s or 60s looking through her closet, or seeing him just wandering around the house. When she'd say anything to get his attention, he'd turn around and look at her, and then vanish. She always thought she was just dreaming or something, but with everything I saw over the years at that house, I can't help but think that it was something else. The hamlet of Trevor Major lies very lonely and sequestered in a hollow below the north side of the South Downs that stretch westward from Lewes and run parallel with the coast. It is a hamlet of some three or four dozen inconsiderable houses and cottages, much girt about with trees, but the big Norman church and the manor house, which stands a little outside the village, are evidence of a more conspicuous past. This latter, except for a tenancy of rather less than three weeks, now four years ago, has stood unoccupied since the summer of 1896, and though it could be taken at a rent almost comically small, it is highly improbable that either of its last tenants, even if times were very bad, would think of passing a night in it again. For myself, I was one of the tenants, I would far prefer living in a workhouse to inhabiting those low-pitched oak-paneled rooms, and I would sooner look from my garret windows onto the squalor and grime of Whitechapel than from the diamond-shaped and leaded panes of the manor of Trevor Major, onto the boscage of its cool thickets, and the glimmering of its clear chalk stream, where the quick trout glance among the waving water weeds and over the chalk and gravel of its sliding rapids. It was the news of these trout that led Jack Singleton and myself to take the house for the month between mid-May and mid-June, but as I've already mentioned, a short three weeks was all the time we passed there and we had more than a week of our tenancy yet unexpired when we left the place, though on the very last afternoon we enjoyed the finest dry fly fishing that has ever fallen to my lot. Singleton had originally seen the advertisement of the house in a Sussex paper, with the statement that there was good dry fly fishing belonging to it, but it was with but faint hopes of the reality of the dry fly fishing that we went down to look at the place, since we had before this so often inspected depopulated ditches which were offered to the unwary under high-sounding titles. Yet after a half-hour stroll by the stream, we went straight back to the agent, and before nightfall had taken it for a month with option of renewal. We arrived accordingly from town at about five o'clock on a cloudless afternoon in May, and through the mists of horror that now stand between me and the remembrance of what occurred later, I cannot forget the exquisite loveliness of the impression then conveyed. The garden, it is true, appeared to have been for years untended. Weeds half choked the gravel paths, and the flower beds were a congestion of mingled, wild, and cultivated vegetations. It was set in a wall of mellowed brick, in which snapdragons and stone crop had found an anchorage to their liking, and beyond that there stood sentinel a ring of ancient pines, in which the breeze made music as of a distant sea. Outside that, the ground sloped slightly downwards, in a bank covered with a jungle of wild rose, to the stream that ran round three sides of the garden, and then followed a meandering course through the two big fields which lay towards the village. Over all this we had fishing rights. Above, the same rights extended for another quarter of a mile, to the arched bridge over which there crossed the road which led to the house. 
in this field above the house on the fourth side, where the ground had been embanked to carry the road, stood a brick kiln in a ruinous state. A shallow pit, long overgrown with tall grasses and wild field flowers, showed where the clay had been dug. The house itself was long and narrow. Entering, you passed direct into a square-paneled hall, on the left of which was the dining room, which communicated with the passage leading to the kitchen and offices. On the right of the hall were two excellent sitting rooms looking out, the one onto the gravel in front of the house, the other onto the garden. From the first of these, you could see, through the gap in the pines by which the road approached the house, the brick kiln of which I've already spoken. An oak staircase went up from the hall, and round it ran a gallery onto which the three principal bedrooms opened. These were commensurate with the dining room and the two sitting rooms below. From this gallery there led a long narrow passage, shut off from the rest of the house by a red baize door, which led to a couple more guest rooms and the servants' quarters. Jack Singleton and I shared the same flat in town, and we had sent down in the morning Franklin and his wife, two old and valued servants, to get things ready at Trevor Major and procure help from the village to look after the house. And Mrs. Franklin, with her stout, comfortable face all wreathed in smiles, opened the door to us. She had had some previous experience of the comfortable quarters which go with fishing and had come down prepared for the worst, but found it all of the best. The kitchen boiler was not furred, Hot and cold water was laid on in the most convenient fashion and could be obtained from taps that neither stuck nor leaked. Her husband, it appeared, had gone into the village to buy a few necessaries, and she brought up tea for us, and then went upstairs to the two rooms over the dining room and the bigger sitting room, which we had chosen for our bedrooms, to unpack. The doors of these were exactly opposite one another, to right and left of the gallery, and Jack, who chose the bedroom above the sitting room, had thus a smaller room, above the second sitting room, unoccupied, next to his and opening out from it. We had a couple of hours fishing before dinner, each of us catching three or four brace of trout, and came back in the dusk to the house. Franklin had returned from the village from his errand, reported that he had got a woman to come in to do housework in the mornings, and mentioned that our arrival had seemed to arouse a good deal of interest. The reason for this was obscure. He could only tell us that he was questioned a dozen times, as to whether we really intended to live in the house, and his assurance that we did produced silence and a shaking of heads. But the country folk of Sussex are notable for their silence and chronic attitude of disapproval, so we put this down to local idiosyncrasy. The evening was exquisitely warm, and after dinner we pulled out a couple of basket chairs onto the gravel by the front door and sat for an hour or so while the night deepened in throbs of gathering darkness. The moon was not risen, and the ring of pines cut off much of the pale starlight, so that when we went in, allured by the shining of the lamp in the sitting room, it was curiously dark for a clear night in May. And at that moment of stepping from the darkness into the cheerfulness of the lighted house, I had a sudden sensation, to which, during the next fortnight, I became almost accustomed, of there being something unseen and unheard and dreadful near me. In spite of the warmth, I felt myself shiver, and concluded instantly that I had sat out of doors long enough, and without mentioning it to Jack, followed him into the smaller sitting room in which we had scarcely yet set foot. It, like the hall, was oak paneled, and in the panels hung some half dozen of watercolor sketches, which we examined, idly at first, and then with growing interest, for they were executed with extraordinary finish and delicacy, and each represented some aspect of the house or garden. Here you looked up the gap in the fir trees into a crimson sunset. Here the garden, trim and carefully tended, dozed beneath some languid summer noon. Here an angry wreath of storm cloud brooded over the meadow, where the trout stream ran gray and leaden below a threatening sky, while another, the most careful and arresting of all, was a study of the brick kiln. In this, alone of them all, was there a human figure, a man dressed in gray, peered into the open door from which issued a fierce red glow. The figure was painted with miniature-like elaboration. The face was in profile and represented a youngish man, clean-shaven, with a long aquiline nose and singularly square chin. The sketch was long and narrow in shape, and the chimney of the kiln appeared against a dark sky. From it there issued a thin stream of gray smoke. Jack looked at this with attention. What a horrible picture, he said and how beautifully painted. I feel as if it meant something, as if it was a representation of something that happened, not a mere sketch. By Jove, 
he broke off suddenly and went in turn to each of the other pictures. That's a queer thing, he said. See if you notice what I mean. With the brick kiln rather vividly impressed on my mind, it was not difficult to see what he had noticed. In each of the pictures appeared the brick kiln, chimney and all, now seen faintly between trees, now in full view, and in each the chimney was smoking. And the odd part is that from the garden side you can't really see the kiln at all, observed Jack. It's hidden by the house, and yet the artist, F.A. as I see by his signature, puts it in just the same. What do you make of that? I asked. Nothing. I suppose he had a fancy for brick kilns. A fortnight of our three weeks passed without incident, except that again and again the curious feeling of something dreadful being close at hand was present in my mind. In a way, as I said, I got used to it, but on the other hand, the feeling itself seemed to gain in poignancy. Once, just at the end of the fortnight, I mentioned it to Jack. Odd you should speak of it, he said, because I felt the same. When do you feel it? Do you feel it now, for instance? We were again sitting out after dinner, and as he spoke I felt it with far greater intensity than ever before. And at the same moment the house door, which had been closed, though probably not latched, swung gently open, letting out a shaft of light from the hall, and as gently swung to again, as if something had stealthily entered. Yes, I said, I felt it then. I only feel it in the evening. It was rather bad that time. Jack was silent for a moment. Funny thing, the door opening and shutting like that, he said. Let's go indoors. We got up, and I remember seeing at that moment that the windows of my bedroom were lit. Mrs. Franklin probably was making things ready for the night. Simultaneously, as we crossed the gravel, there came from just inside the house the sound of a hurried footstep on the stairs, and entering we found Mrs. Franklin in the hall, looking rather white and startled. Anything wrong? I asked. She took two or three quick breaths before she answered. No, sir, she said, at least nothing that I can give an account of. I was tidying up in your room and I thought you came in, but there was nobody, and it gave me a turn. I left my candle there. I must go up for it. I waited in the hall a moment while she again ascended the stairs and passed along the gallery to my room. At the door, which I could see was open, she paused, not entering. What's the matter? I asked from below. I left the candle alight, she said, and it's gone out. Jack laughed. And you left the door and window open, said he. Yes, sir, but not a breath of wind is stirring, said Mrs. Franklin rather faintly. This was true, and yet a few moments ago the heavy hall door had swung open and back again. Jack ran upstairs. We'll brave the dark together, Mrs. Franklin, he said. He went into my room and I heard the sound of a match struck. Then, through the open door, came the light of the rekindled candle, and simultaneously I heard a bell ring in the servants' quarters. In a moment came steps, and Franklin appeared. "'What bell was that?' I asked. "'Mr. Jack's bedroom, sir,' he said. I felt there was a marked atmosphere of nerves, about for which there was really no adequate cause. All that had happened of a disturbing nature was that Mrs. Franklin had thought I had come into my bedroom, and had then been startled by finding I had not. She had then left the candle in a draft, and it had been blown out. As for the bell ringing, that, even if it had happened, was a very innocuous proceeding. Mouse on a wire, I said. Mr. Jack is in my room this moment, lighting Mrs. Franklin's candle for her. Jack came down at this juncture, and we went into the sitting room. But Franklin apparently was not satisfied, for we heard him in the room above us, which was Jack's bedroom, moving about with his slow and rather ponderous tread. Then his steps seemed to pass into the bedroom adjoining, and we heard no more. I remember feeling hugely sleepy that night, and we went to bed earlier than usual, to pass rather a broken night with stretches of dreamless sleep interspersed with startled awakenings, in which I passed very suddenly into complete consciousness. Sometimes the house was absolutely still, and the only sound to be heard was the sighing of the night breeze outside in the pines, but sometimes the place seemed full of muffled movements, and once I could have sworn that the handle of my door turned. That required verification, and I lit my candle, but found that my ears must have played me false. Yet even as I stood there, I thought I heard steps just outside, and with a considerable qualm, I must confess, I opened the door and looked out. But the gallery was quite empty, and the house quite still. Then, from Jack's room opposite, I heard a sound that was somehow comforting, the snorts of the snorer, and I went back to bed and slept again 
and when next I woke, morning was already breaking in red lines on the horizon, and the sense of trouble that had been with me ever since last evening had gone. Heavy rain set in after lunch next day, and as I had arrears of letter writing to do, and the water was soon both muddy and rising, I came home alone about five, leaving Jack still sanguine by the stream, and worked for a couple of hours sitting at a writing table in the room overlooking the gravel at the front of the house, where hung the watercolors. By seven I had finished, and just as I got up to light candles, since it was already dusk, I saw, as I thought, Jack's figure emerge from the bushes that bordered the path to the stream onto the space in front of the house. Then, instantaneously and with a sudden queer sinking of the heart quite unaccountable, I saw that it was not Jack at all, but a stranger. He was only some six yards from the window, and after pausing there a moment, he came close up to the window so that his face nearly touched the glass, looking intently at me. In the light from the freshly kindled candles, I could distinguish his features with great clearness, but though, as far as I knew, I had never seen him before, there was something familiar about both his face and figure. He appeared to smile at me, but the smile was one of inscrutable evil and malevolence, and immediately he walked on, straight towards the house door opposite him, and out of sight of the sitting room window. Now, little though I liked the look of the man, he was, as I have said, familiar to my eye, and I went out into the hall, since he was clearly coming to the front door, to open it to him and learn his business. So without waiting for him to ring, I opened it, feeling sure I should find him on the step. Instead, I looked out into the empty gravel sweep, the heavy falling rain, the thick dusk. And even as I looked, I felt something that I could not see push by me through the half-open door and pass into the house. Then the stairs creaked, and a moment after, a bell rang. Franklin is the quickest man to answer a bell I have ever seen, and next instant he passed me going upstairs. He tapped at Jack's door, entered, and then came down again. Mr. Jack's still out, sir? he asked. Yes. His bell ringing again? Yes, sir, said Franklin, quite imperturbably. I went back into the sitting room, and soon Franklin brought a lamp. He put it on the table, above which hung the careful and curious picture of the brick kiln, and then, with a sudden horror, I saw why the stranger on the gravel outside had been so familiar to me. In all respects, he resembled the figure that peered into the kiln. It was more than a resemblance, it was an identity. And what had happened to this man who had inscrutably and evilly smiled at me? And what had pushed in through the half-closed door? At that moment, I saw the face of fear. My mouth went dry, and I heard my heart leaping and cracking in my throat. That face was only turned on me for a moment and then away again, but I knew it to be the genuine thing. Not apprehension, not foreboding, not a feeling of being startled, but fear, cold fear. And then, though nothing had occurred to assuage the fear, it passed, and a certain sort of reason usurped its place. I had certainly seen somebody on the gravel outside the house. I had supposed he was going to the front door. I had opened it and found he had not come to the front door. Or, and once again the terror resurged, had the invisible pushing thing been that which I had seen outside? And if so, what was it? And how came it that the face and figure of the man I had seen were the same as those which were so scrupulously painted in the picture of the brick kiln? I set myself to argue down the fear for which there was no more foundation than this, this and the repetition of the ringing bell, and my belief is that I did so. I told myself, till I believed it, that a man, a human man, had been walking across the gravel outside, and that he had not come to the front door, but had gone, as he might easily have done, up the drive into the high road. I told myself that it was mere fancy that was the cause of the belief that something had pushed in by me, and as for the ringing of the bell, I said to myself, as was true, that this had happened before, and I must ask the reader to believe also that I argued these things away, and looked no longer on the face of fear itself. I was not comfortable, but I fell short of being terrified. I sat down again by the window, looking onto the gravel in front of the house, and finding another letter that asked, though it did not demand, an answer, proceeded to occupy myself with it. Straight in front led the drive through the gap in the pines, and passed through the field where lay the brick kiln. In a pause of page-turning, I looked up and saw something unusual about it. At the same moment, an unusual smell came to my nostril. What I saw was smoke coming out of the chimney of the kiln. What I smelt was the odor of roasting meat. 
The wind, such as there was, set from the kiln to the house, but as far as I knew, the smell of roast meat probably came from the kitchen, where dinner, so I supposed, was cooking. I had to tell myself this. I wanted reassurance, lest the face of fear should look whitely on me again. Then there came a crisp step on the gravel, a rattle at the front door, and Jack came in. Good sport, he said, you gave up too soon. And he went straight to the table, above which hung the picture of the man at the brick kiln, and looked at it. Then there was silence, and eventually I spoke, for I wanted to know one thing. Seen anybody? I asked. Yes, why do you ask? Because I have also, the man in that picture. Jack came and sat down near me. It's a ghost, you know, he said. He came down to the river about dusk, and stood near me for an hour. At first I thought he was real, and I warned him that he had better stand further off if he didn't want to be hooked. And then it struck me he wasn't real, and I cast, well, right through him, and about seven he walked up towards the house. Were you frightened? No, it was so tremendously interesting. So you saw him here too? Whereabouts? Just outside. I think he is in the house now. Jack looked round. Did you see him come in? He asked. No, but I felt him. There's another queer thing too. The chimney of the brick kiln is smoking. Jack looked out of the window. It was nearly dark, but the wreathing smoke could just be seen. So it is, he said. Fat, greasy smoke. I think I'll go up and see what's on. Come too? I think not, I said. Are you frightened? It isn't worthwhile. Besides, it is so tremendously interesting. Jack came back from his little expedition, still interested. He had found nothing stirring at the kiln, but though it was then nearly dark, the interior was faintly luminous and against the black of the sky he could see a wisp of thick white smoke floating northwards. But for the rest of the evening we neither heard nor saw anything of abnormal import, and the next day ran a course of undisturbed hours. Then suddenly a hellish activity was manifested. That night, while I was undressing for bed, I heard a bell ring furiously, and I thought I heard a shout also. I guessed where the ring came from, since Franklin and his wife had long ago gone to bed, and went straight to Jack's room. But as I tapped at the door, I heard his voice from inside calling loud to me. Take care, it said. He's close to the door. A sudden qualm of blank fear took hold of me, but mastering it as best I could, I opened the door to enter, and once again something pushed softly by me, though I saw nothing. Jack was standing by his bed, half undressed. I saw him wipe his forehead with the back of his hand. He's been here again, he said. I was standing just here a minute ago when I found him close by me. He came out of the inner room, I think. Did you see what he had in his hand? I saw nothing. It was a knife, a great long carving knife. Do you mind my sleeping on the sofa in your room tonight? I got an awful turn then. There was another thing too. All round the edge of his clothes, at his collar and at his wrists, there were little flames playing, little white licking flames. But next day, again, we neither heard nor saw anything, nor that night did the sense of that dreadful presence in the house come to us. And then came the last day. We had been out till it was dark, and as I said, had a wonderful day among the fish. On reaching home, we sat together in the sitting room, when suddenly from overhead came a tread of feet, a violent pealing of the bell, and the moment after, yell after yell, as if someone in mortal agony. The thought occurred to both of us that this might be Mrs. Franklin in terror of some fearful sight, and together we rushed up and sprang into Jack's bedroom. The doorway into the room beyond was open, and just inside it we saw the man bending over some dark huddled object. Though the room was dark, we could see him perfectly, for a light, stale and impure, seemed to come from him. He had again a long knife in his hand, and as we entered he was wiping it on the mass that lay at his feet. Then he took it up, and we saw that it was a woman with head nearly severed. But it was not Mrs. Franklin. And then the whole thing vanished, and we were standing looking into a dark and empty room. We went downstairs without a word, and it was not till we were both in the sitting room below that Jack spoke. And he takes her to the brick kiln, he said rather unsteadily. I say, have you had enough of this house? I have. There's hell in it. About a week later, Jack put into my hand a guidebook to Sussex, open at the description of Trevor Major. And I read, 
Just outside the village stands the picturesque manor house, once the home of the artist and notorious murderer, Francis Adam. It was here he killed his wife in a fit, it is believed, of groundless jealousy, cutting her throat and disposing of her remains by burning them in a brick kiln. Certain charred fragments found six months afterwards led to his arrest and execution. So I prefer to leave the house with the brick kiln and the picture signed F.A. to others. He was waiting for her. He had been waiting an hour and a half in a dusty suburban lane, with a row of big elms on one side and some eligible building sites on the other, and far away to the southwest, the twinkling yellow lights of the Crystal Palace. It was not quite like a country lane, for it had a pavement and lamp posts, but it was not a bad place for a meeting all the same, and farther up towards the cemetery, it was really quite rural and almost pretty, especially in twilight. But twilight had long deepened into night, and still he waited. He loved her, and he was engaged to be married to her, with the complete disapproval of every reasonable person who had been consulted. And this half-clandestine meeting was tonight to take the place of the grudgingly sanctioned weekly interview, because a certain rich uncle was visiting at her house, and her mother was not the woman to acknowledge to a moneyed uncle, who might go off any day, a match so deeply ineligible as hers with him. So he waited for her, and the chill of an unusually severe May evening entered into his bones. The policeman passed him with but a surly response to his good night. The bicyclists went by him like grey ghosts with foghorns, and it was nearly ten o'clock, and she had not come. He shrugged his shoulders and turned towards his lodgings. His road led him by her house, desirable, commodious, semi-detached, and he walked slowly as he neared it. She might even now be coming out, but she was not. There was no sign of movement about the house, no sign of life, no lights even in the windows, and her people were not early people. He paused by the gate, wondering. Then he noticed that the front door was open, wide open, and the street lamp shone a little way into the dark hall. There was something about all this that did not please him, that scared him a little indeed. The house had a gloomy and deserted air, it was obviously impossible that it harbored a rich uncle. The old man must have left early, in which case... He walked up the path of patent glazed tiles and listened. No sign of life. He passed into the hall. There was no light anywhere. Where was everybody, and why was the front door open? There was no one in the drawing room. The dining room and the study, nine feet by seven, were equally blank. Everyone was out, evidently but the unpleasant sense that he was, perhaps, not the first casual visitor to walk through that open door impelled him to look through the house before he went away and closed it after him. So he went upstairs, and at the door of the first bedroom he came to, he struck a wax match, as he had done in the sitting rooms. Even as he did so, he felt that he was not alone. And he was prepared to see something, but for what he saw, he was not prepared. For what he saw lay on the bed, in a white loose gown, and it was his sweetheart, and its throat was cut from ear to ear. He doesn't know what happened then, nor how he got downstairs and into the street, but he got out somehow, and the policeman found him in a fit, under the lamp post at the corner of the street. He couldn't speak when they picked him up, and he passed the night in the police cells, because the policeman had seen plenty of drunken men before, but never one in a fit. The next morning he was better, though still very white and shaky but the tale he told the magistrate was convincing, and they sent a couple of constables with him to her house. There was no crowd about it, as he fancied there would be, and the blinds were not down. As he stood, dazed, in front of the door, it opened, and she came out. He held on to the doorpost for support. "'She's all right, you see,' said the constable, who had found him under the lamp. "'I told you you was drunk, but you would know best.' When he was alone with her, he told her, not all, for that would not bear telling, but how he had come into the commodious semi-detached, and how he had found the door open and the lights out, and that he had been into that long back room facing the stairs, and had seen something, in even trying to hint at which he turned sick and broke down and had to have brandy given to him. 
But my dearest, she said, I dare say the house was dark, for we were all at the Crystal Palace with my uncle. And no doubt the door was open, for the maids will run out if they're left. But you could not have been in that room, because I locked it when I came away, and the key was in my pocket. I dressed in a hurry, and I left all my odds and ends lying about. I know, he said. I saw a green scarf on a chair, and some long brown gloves, and a lot of hairpins and ribbons, and a prayer book, and a lace handkerchief on the dressing table. Why, I even noticed the almanac on the mantelpiece, October 21st. At least it couldn't be that, because this is May, and yet it was. Your almanac is at October 21st, isn't it? No, of course it isn't, she said, smiling rather anxiously. But all the other things were just as you say. You must have had a dream or a vision or something. He was a very ordinary, commonplace city young man, and he didn't believe in visions. But he never rested day or night till he got his sweetheart and her mother away from that commodious semi-detached and settled them in a quite distant suburb. In the course of the removal, he incidentally married her, and the mother went on living with them. His nerves must have been a good bit shaken, because he was very queer for a long time, and was always inquiring if anyone had taken the desirable semi-detached, and when an old stockbroker with a family took it, he went the length of calling on the old gentleman and imploring him by all that he held dear not to live in that fatal house. Why, said the stockbroker, not unnaturally. And then he got so vague and confused between trying to tell why and trying not to tell why that the stockbroker showed him out and thanked his God he was not such a fool as to allow a lunatic to stand in the way of his taking that really remarkably cheap and desirable semi-detached residence. Now the curious and quite inexplicable part of this story is that when she came down to breakfast on the morning of the 22nd of October, she found him looking like death with the morning paper in his hand. He caught hers, he couldn't speak, and pointed to the paper. And there she read that on the night of the 21st, a young lady, the stockbroker's daughter, had been found with her throat cut from ear to ear on the bed in the long back bedroom facing the stairs of that desirable semi-detached. <laughs>